We can think about the paradox of democracy. The idea that we, the people, are in charge of political decisions, and yet we make bad choices. Why would we pick bad outcomes for ourselves? This mini lecture is going to cover that topic and talk about the concept of rational ignorance. The basic idea here is that life is all about trade-offs. We can't know everything. We have to pick and choose what we actually become informed about or what we actually know. We have to make those trade-offs. So we become rationally, we think about, and we make a decision and determine where we are ignorant. We're rationally ignorant. We decide what we know and what we don't know to some extent. So for example, I don't know that much about ballet. I could go on to various websites and find out more information than I currently have about ballet. However, there's very little payoff for me to do this. And so I don't spend the time searching around on these websites or talking to other people to find out more about ballet. Simply put, the marginal cost of figuring out more information is not worth the marginal benefit that I derive from learning more about ballet. In politics, we don't know a lot of things. We're rationally ignorant. Rational ignorance is the standard economic approach to the limitations of voters. Rational ignorance is refraining from acquiring knowledge when the cost of educating oneself exceeds the potential benefit that the knowledge would provide. Why does this concept fit with politics, which are seemingly very important for each of us to know? Well, the crucial insight is that there is a low probability of decisiveness in voting, which makes the expected value of voting very low you're not very likely to be a, the decisive swing vote when you're in a, especially a large scale voting, like a national election or something like that. There is a low probability that you are the decisive vote, that you tip the vote to either make a tie or break a tie. This changes the probabilities of the payoffs. And when we have different probabilities attached to the payoffs of certain behavior, it impacts what actions we take. So as a very simple example, you can imagine a situation where I could say to you, hey, you have $30 million waiting for you with 100% certainty down the road at the local gas station. How would you be acting right now? Well, right now, most of you would get up out of your seat and get to that gas station as quickly as you could and collect your millions of dollars. However, you do have a probabilistic chance in reality of getting those millions and millions of dollars right now, but it's a very small probability. And given that you have a very, very small probability of winning $30 million at the local gas station via the lottery right now, you're acting in a different manner. You're not acting the same way that you would if it was 100% certain that you had that million of millions and millions of dollars down there for you. This is how probabilistic behavior sh is shown to be different than when we have certainty, right? We have different behaviors here. Well, in voting, we have probabilistic behavior. What are the chances that we either make a tie or break a tie? Because that is the only way we actually change the outcome of an election. Statisticians, pol political scientists, and economists agree that the probability of decisiveness in most votes is very, very low. It is a mathematical formula. We can estimate it in slightly different ways, but it is basically true by the numbers. It's math. It is not just an idea that somebody holds that, well, it's probably unlikely that we make a tie or break a tie. The reality is that in most elections, the probability of decisiveness is quite low. Brian Kaplan provides a basic mathematical estimation for the probability of decisiveness. Here we'll give you this equation, but we need to kind of know what to plug in for different elements. So to start us off, we can assume that the number of voters is equal to 2n plus 1. So the number, thus the number of voters minus 1 and then divided by 2 is equal to n. Okay, which this just basically helps us avoid the sticky problems of ties. So n is not our number of voters. The number of voters is 2n plus 1. 
everyone but yourself, we can say, votes for the proposal, the election, whatever it is, votes on one side, votes for it with a probability of P. And this means that they vote against with a probability of one minus P. The closer that P is to 50, the closer the election is expected to be. So if we have a very close election, our P may be 0.49. Here we'll just quickly kind of go through the math to think about the probability of decisiveness with this estimator given to us by Brian Kaplan. Uh, we won't have the, the perfect outcomes of mathematical calculations of what the probability of decisiveness is, but this is a pretty good rule of thumb to follow. It, it does a pretty good job. And all you need to know is the number of people who are voting uh, and then also the probabilities at which they vote. So is it a close election? Is it not a close election? Things like that. And we can plug those things in to see the probability of decisiveness in different types of elections. So here we have a 21 member faculty tenure vote with incredibly close odds. So you're in a faculty of uh, say the economics department at a university that has 21 members and they are going to vote on if another individual should receive tenure or not. The probability that which people vote for this is 0.5. So it's incredibly, incredibly close. You don't really know what's happening. And if we have 21 members, then our N is equal to 10. We can plug it into this equation, this estimating probability of decisiveness uh, equation here and we can see what happens. So with this close tenure vote, we can plug in our N, which is 10, and we can plug in our P, the probability that people vote for the passing of the, the individual for tenure. And from this, we can see the outcome. So from this, we can see that the outcome, the probability of decisiveness is 17.84%. So this is a incredibly close 10-year vote with just 21 people. Your chances of making or breaking a tie are a little bit less than one out of five. All right, so let's go to another example here. This is a moderately close county election where you have 10,001 citizens. So your N is equal to 5,000. And it's moderately close, so we're saying people uh, vote on one side at a probability of 0.53. If you look at this example, you can then plug in your N, plug in the P, and your outcome is the probability of decisiveness is about 1.18 times 10 to the negative 10th or roughly zero. Now, as I said, this is admittedly a simple estimator of the probability of decisiveness, but you can see how quickly the numbers drop to near zero. For virtually any real world election, the probability of casting the decisive vote is not just small, it is normally infinitesimal when we're talking about national or even state or regional elections. If you're in a very small scale operation where you have only around 21 people, you can get some probability of making or breaking a tie as long as the P, the probability that people vote on one side or the other, is very close to 0.5. You can fiddle around with some of the numbers and see that even with small Ns, if the P is not close to 0.5, you can get a very low probability of decisiveness, or you can see that even on the extremes when the P is uh, you know, just a little bit off of the 0.5 amount that a high N makes the probability of decisiveness basically zero. The extreme observation that you will not affect the outcome of a major election by voting is quite frankly true for all practical purposes. Rational ignorance then makes sense in voting if you can't impact the election, then maybe there's no benefit from acquiring knowledge. Maybe you just stay rationally ignorant. There is a mountain of empirical evidence that backs up the claim that there is rational ignorance in voting. Touching on just one study by Diane Ziegler, 
you can look to specific policies and see how much political knowledge voters have. Right? Voters look far worse when you get more and more specific in terms of policies. And once you once you reach foreign policy, the level, level of ignorance is basically shocking. Here we have some just common political knowledge uh, ideas, and we have a study that looks at the percentage of people that know these things. Uh, we're already down to only four out of five of the people can name the vice president. Right? And so you can look here, and there's lots of different studies that showcase different things about this, uh, this lack of political knowledge. And so this is very clear that people do not know what they're talking about when it comes to the basics of politics. So what are we to say about political knowledge? Well, one thing that we can say is perhaps people are rationally ignorant.